Our connection to other people is ultimately built on having a strong connection to ourself. Today's episode was recorded before the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus outbreak a pandemic and before stay-at-home orders were issued across the United States. As many of us are social distancing and separate from one another, I think you'll find this conversation more important than ever. And remember that just because we're separated doesn't mean we can't stay connected. Connecting with family and friends over video or phone calls has been really meaningful to me during this time and can make a huge difference for our mental health, even with just five or 10 minutes a day. Now on to my conversation with former Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy. Welcome to Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman, and that's Pharmacy with an F, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, a place for conversations that matter. And if you've ever suffered loneliness or felt isolated or disconnected in your life, this conversation is gonna to matter to you because we have an extraordinary guest today, a former Surgeon General of the United States, uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy, who uh, I've known for a number of years, who actually invited me to come to meet with him when he was Surgeon General to talk about the issues of food and obesity and nutrition and disease. And he's just always is so attentive and connected. He came to Cleveland Clinic to talk about the opioid epidemic. And I tried to get the uh, leadership there to do what he did in the Surgeon General's office, which is to get the entire clinic meditating every day at three o'clock in the afternoon. The, C <laughs> the chief of staff was a little confused when I said that. But I, <laughs> I think it's really what we all need to be doing. I usually sneak off in my little room in my office and just try to do meditation in the afternoon when I'm there. But he's, he's an extraordinary leader in, in medicine, in public health. Um, and his new book, Together, The Healing Power of Human Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World, or I would probably have titled it An Often Lonely World, uh, is really an extraordinary contribution to our understanding of what creates so much suffering and dis-ease and actually disease. Because if you're looking at the causes, the root causes of chronic illness, it's often related not just to food, which is my lane, but to loneliness. And uh, people don't understand that that's actually a big driver of so much. And we're going to talk about that. He, uh, Dr. Murthy, is a uh, is a extraordinary guy. He was the Vice Admiral of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, where he commanded a uniformed service of 6,600 public health officers globally. He launched the Turn the Tide campaign, which was to help our nation's healthcare providers focus on our opioid epidemic. Uh, and was he was a key leader in addressing that crisis while he was Surgeon General. He issued the first Surgeon General's report on alcohol, drugs, and health, calling for expanded access to prevention and treatment and recognizing addiction as a chronic disease, not a character flaw, which many people still think it is and stigmatize it. Uh, he's then focused uh, from 2017, his attention on chronic stress and loneliness as huge problems that affect our health, our productivity, and our happiness. He co-founded a number of organizations, Visions, which is an HIV AIDS education program in India. I'm not sure I'm saying this right, Swasya, which is a community health partnership in rural India that trains women as health providers and educators, sort of like barefoot doctors in China, but for women, I guess. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he helped uh, build the grassroots organization Doctors for America that was very involved in um, the election of President Obama. And since he's left uh, Surgeon General's office, he's focused on loneliness and social connection. And his book, Together, The Healing Power of Human Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World, is out April 28th, uh, HarperCollins. He's just an extraordinary guy. He's, he's degree from Harvard, his MD and MBA from Yale. Uh, he went to residency in Boston and was on the Harvard Medical School faculty. He's a very serious dude and a good friend. <laughs> and I really am so happy to have him here on the podcast. Welcome, Vivek. Thank you so much, Mark. I, I feel somewhat embarrassed after that introduction, <laughs> but um, thank you. And he's only 25, which is what's amazing. Uh, no, no. <laughs> I don't know. Are you 40 yet? I got a lot of... I'm 42. <laughs> okay, 42. So the best is yet to come. I have a feeling. <laughs> he's just getting started. I think, were you the youngest Surgeon General ever? Um, in about a century or so. The very first Surgeon General uh, in the 1800s was younger than I was. That's because nobody lived very long back then, right? So. Yeah, I think he died in his 40s. So, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's unbelievable in 100 years. Uh, and that just speaks to your, your character, your intelligence, your insightfulness about some of the biggest things that are affecting our public health today. And I, I'm just so glad you laser focused on this issue of loneliness because, mm. you know, I've uh, in the early part of my career, I focused on food as a big driver of chronic disease. And still, it's, it's what I'm focusing on. And functional medicine to take care of the individual. But I realized that 
I could not really get my patients better unless I deal with the social issues that they're facing. Uh, and I began to realize that there's another medicine that's just as powerful as food, and that's love and social connection. Hmm. So I would say love is medicine, food is medicine. That's how to, we're going to yeah. help the world. And you really lasered in on the love is medicine through looking through the lens of, of loneliness. And, and um, how, how did that all come about? I mean, you, you basically you know, are traditionally trained internal medicine doctor. And you know, uh, it's, it's not something we are really taught about in medical school is loneliness. So how did you come to that? Well, it's, it's a good question. You know, I think I had experienced loneliness a fair amount in my own life. And, you know, when I was a kid in school, you know, I was very shy and I didn't, I had a hard time making friends in elementary school. And each day going to school and being dropped off by my parents, I had that pit in my stomach of, mm. of nervousness. And it wasn't because I was scared about exams or, <laughs> or, or teachers. I was actually just worried I was going to be alone again. And I just couldn't wait for the bell to ring uh, at 2.30 or 3 o'clock or whenever it was so that I could go back home mm. and be where I felt really good because I had loving parents and an amazing sister and I felt very cared for and taken care of at home. Um, so it was certainly a presence in my life and it cropped up many other times, you know, during adulthood as well, um, at transition points in my life and even during my time as Surgeon General uh, and in the years afterward. Uh, I also then started to see it uh, in my patients. And this is not something I expected at all, because mm. when I was in medical school, and I suspect that you and many of us had the same experience, um, loneliness was not part of the curriculum. Nope. Emotional well-being was not a class. Loneliness 101, no. Yeah, this is not part of, um, for that matter, neither was nutrition. You know, mm -hmm. like I, I still remember our nutrition education in medical school was one class once a week in the evenings that was optional mm. for like six weeks. Yeah, and it was and probably on like vitamin deficiency diseases like <laughs> rickets and scurvy. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of, of training. But certainly on this subject of our emotional health and the power and importance of social connection, there was very little. Mm. Um, but when I started seeing patients, um, there were a couple of things that struck me. One is that people would come in with with real serious illnesses and they would have, um, you know, and, the, and illnesses are critical times in people's lives where they've got to make big decisions and they have to, they find themselves reflecting on the rest of their life uh, to see, you know, gosh, uh, you know, have I lived the life I want to live? And at those critical moments, you need people around you to help you figure out what path to take uh, and just to support you and be there with you. But so many of the patients were mm -hmm. alone. Uh, and I remember I used to sometimes They ask just were in them. the hospital by themselves. They were there by themselves. And I would ask sometimes, I would say, hey, you know, we, we've got to make a, a pretty difficult decision now, you know, on whether to go to surgery or not, um, or whether to start uh, chemotherapy or not. Uh, is there somebody you want us to call uh, to come in so that we, you can talk it through with them as well? And so often the answer was no. There's mm. nobody to call. Wow. Even at the time of death, Mark, I noticed that on so many occasions that the only ones to witness people's last moments uh, were myself and the other doctors and nurses that was the medical staff. Um, and so I re remember that quite vividly. But even despite all of that, I was not planning to talk about loneliness or work on it when I was Surgeon General because... I didn't know if that was just my own experience mm -hmm. or maybe my own, mm -hmm. the peculiarities of, the, of my medical experience as well. Yeah. But what happened that really changed things for me is when I began my time in office, I began with a listening tour. So yeah. I traveled to all of these cities and towns all across America with a simple question, how can we help? And I tried to just sit back and listen to what people said. And what they said was fascinating uh, because I did hear stories I expected about addiction, about obesity, about depression and anxiety mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what i didn't expect to hear that within those stories were these threads of loneliness mm. uh, and people wouldn't say you know hi i'm mark i'm lonely but they would say things like this they would say i feel invisible mm. i feel like we're struggling all alone here mm. i feel like people have forgotten about us uh, i feel like people just don't even see us and if we died no one would even know it mm. um, people would say things like that quite often and it led me to realize over time, as I heard more and more of those stories from everyone from farmers in rural areas to moms and dads in big cities to members of Congress, I started to realize that not only is loneliness far more common than but we But you thought. were hearing this from members of Congress. Oh, yeah. And they wouldn't say it publicly. But interestingly, behind closed doors, they would say, yeah, you know, this has been a struggle for us. I had one member of Congress, in fact, tell me, he said, if you're going to build a campaign to address loneliness, could you start with Congress first? Because we're start all with struggling. me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, but the truth is that I realized nobody was spared, that, that mm-hmm. we, we, people were either affected directly or through the people they loved, and that all of us at some level in modern society are vulnerable to losing our connections. Mm. So it's so intense. And I think that, uh, you, you know, we're, we're really wired as social beings because mm-hmm. a human being by him or herself in the world is usually dead, right? <laughs> Uh, historically, if you didn't have a tribe or a group that helped you navigate and survive the world, you would just die. And yet something's changed in the last 100 plus years. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and you sort of say it's really different. This modern day loneliness is different than anything that has happened in other generations. And, and how, how does it actually affect us? I mean, what is the science behind loneliness and its effect on our health and our, our longevity? And, and what do we know about that? Well, it starts with with what you just touched on. Understanding how loneliness impacts our bodies starts with how we were thousands of years ago. And we, over time, evolved to really need each other. So thousands of years ago when we were hunter-gatherers, there was safety in numbers. So if you had a trusted group of people that you were with, you could take turns keeping watch at night uh, to make sure that there weren't predators that attack. You could also pool your food so that you had a stable food supply over time instead of starving for many days at a time. You could also do other things like help in child rearing. So you could have, you, people could take care of each other's kids mm-hmm. and, and share uh, the responsibilities, which can be quite taxing if it's just you alone, uh, mm. managing a growing family. And so we, over time, came to depend on other people for our safety, so much so that when we were separated from the tribe, when we were effectively more at risk then of starvation or being pursued by a predator, it put us in a stress state. Mm. And now, in some ways, that's actually a very healthy response because that stress state would raise our threat level and focus us inward and push us to quickly get back to the tribe as quickly as possible. Yeah. And that's, in, in a sense, what loneliness is like. Like loneliness, like hunger or thirst, is a signal that our body is sending us that we're lacking something that we need for survival. And if we react quickly to that and fill the gap you know, with social connection, healthy social connection in our life, then that feeling of loneliness goes away and we're and we're okay. Hmm. The problem, though, is when that state of threat, which is effectively a physiological stress state, persists for a long period of time. Like we know that stress is not good for us, Hmm. you know, when it when it but it's only in in the case of it being there for a long period of time or an excessive amount. Small, it's adaptive in a small... Yeah, small amounts can actually be quite good. Like before we're, we give a big speech or take an exam uh, or you know, take on any big task or go out on a, uh, on, a, on a date that we're really excited about, we mm. might feel some stress, yeah. right? And that might push us to perform better and to actually bring out the best in ourselves. Yeah. But when we're chronically stressed, that actually is when our body starts to break down. That's when we have elevated levels of cortisol and other stress hormones flowing in our body We have increased levels of inflammation, and that over time damages tissues, blood vessels, and leads to higher rates of heart disease and other illnesses. And so loneliness, when it's chronic, when it's longstanding, puts Mm. us in a chronic stress state. And it's from that that we see so many of the negative consequences. Now, there are other practical implications to our health of not having connections. Some of the day-to-day help we might need, going to the doctor, taking our medicines, having someone to remind us and inspire us to eat healthily or to go and work out. To have a reason for living. Right, <laughs> right to have a reason for living. We may miss out on these things too. So our, the healthiness of our lifestyle may deteriorate as well. Um, but what we see overall is when you look at the data, at the impact of loneliness on our health, what you find is that loneliness is associated with a reduction in our lifespan. And that mortality impact is similar to the mortality impact of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Wow. It's greater than the mortality impact of sedentary living and obesity. I think as Surgeon General, how much time I spent on those three issues, on smoking, obesity, and physical activity, compared to how much I spent on loneliness. Wow. And there was no comparison. Wait, we got to stop there for a minute, because what you just said was, was remarkable, that loneliness is a bigger risk factor for a shortened lifespan mm-hmm. than smoking, obesity, or lack of exercise. Well, it seems to be just That's like headline news. (laughs) (laughs) It seems to be just as powerful as smoking 15 cigarettes a day and and even greater than the impact of obesity. Which is pretty deadly. I mean, smoking is pretty deadly. So this is something that's not talked about. It's something that we don't... I mean, I'm I'm in a big healthcare system. Mm -hmm. We talk about the Office of Experience and and improved patients and doctors' experience. Mm -hmm. But this issue of loneliness being a risk factor, I just... It's just not in our training and it's not 
in our even approach as a culture to figure out how to solve some of our big issues like depression and the opioid epidemic and you know why people eat <laughs> you know it's not only about what people eat it's, it's why, why people eat you know exactly right. i often say you know you don't have to focus on what you're eating but what's eating you yeah <laughs> and i think people don't don't understand that connection and i i think the question is you know what's happened to our society mm -hmm. that's led to this and, and how do we get it back mm -hmm. to a place where we do have connection and not social media which actually mm -hmm. leads to more isolation more disconnection more separation feelings of isolation you see mm -hmm. you know the, the instagram models and this and that it just sort of makes you feel bad about yourself it's not really true social connection yeah so uh, let me pick up on one thing you said even earlier also and then i'll get to what's driving this but Something you said, I think, is really important, which is that we weren't really trained to think about this or to yeah. recognize how important it was. And I think part of the challenge is that we don't see loneliness around us very much. And there are two There's reasons. There's no blood for test that. for loneliness. <laughs> there, there isn't. You're right. But also, even if we just think about the people in our lives, we may not recognize that loneliness is that common. But there are two big reasons for that. One is because there's a, a huge stigma around loneliness. Shame. Yeah. There's a sense of shame that people have because they feel... Like if they say that I'm lonely, that's like saying I'm not likable or I'm not lovable or I'm not desirable in some yeah. way. Um, it's like saying I'm a loser and nobody wants to feel that way. I certainly didn't when I was younger and felt lonely. I didn't never told anyone about that. But the, there's another reason though that loneliness is hard to see. And that's because we stereotypically might think of loneliness as the person who's sitting in the corner at a party and not interacting with anyone. But that would have been me as a kid. Yeah. And well, actually, was, I never got invited to the party. So well, how yeah, I wasn't at the party. I was at home. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But, what, but the other reason we don't see it is because it looks like other things. So loneliness can look like depression. Mm -hmm. It can look like anxiety. Mm. It can often lead to uh, addiction or increase our risk for addiction. In fact, the founder of AA, uh, one of the most interesting things I found that he said, is that loneliness he felt was at the root cause of so many people's struggles with alcoholism mm. and needed to be addressed in order for them to get into and stay in recovery. Yeah. And that is something I found also when looking at the opioid epidemic. And you know, there's a reason that the opioid epidemic has been labeled, uh, you know, part of the larger group of illnesses called deaths of despair, because it is often a sense of, of hopelessness and isolation that can lead people to experience emotional pain. And then as human beings, once we experience emotional pain, we will seek to relieve that pain. And the question in those moments is what are we reaching for? So are we reaching for alcohol? Are we reaching for drugs? Are we reaching for food? Bag That's of not Doritos. good for us. <laughs> right. Um, are we reaching for exercise? Some people work out when they feel stressed or in pain and that helps them. Are we reaching for work? Some people drown themselves in work when the stresses of their personal yeah, that life or been disconnection. Me. That would heart. be me. <laughs> right. And this is the thing is that there are socially acceptable ways uh, to sometimes deal with your pain, even though it doesn't, it hurts you in the long run. Yeah. And alcohol, I think, and, and work are two examples of those. But for those reasons, when you look around you, you might think, well, maybe I don't know that many people are lonely. But I will tell you that the statistics back up the fact that a very large number of people that we know are likely struggling with loneliness. If you look at the conservative numbers, um, what you'll find is that probably somewhere around 20 to 22% of adults in the United States are struggling with loneliness. Those are the lower numbers. <clears throat> wow. But there are plenty of other studies, uh, including one recently by uh, Cigna, the health insurer, which have pegged those numbers as significantly higher. And it's not just the US. And what, what percent? <clears throat> Well, in the Cigna study, the most recently, they found that it's in the 60s. It's more than 60% 60%. of adults who, uh, who actually say they're struggling with loneliness. Now, this is either because loneliness, um, maybe loneliness is increasing. Maybe people are just more comfortable now starting to admit that they're struggling with loneliness. Maybe the studies are getting better. Who knows what the reasons are? And it could be potentially all of those. But the point is that we are talking about more people who struggle with loneliness than have diabetes in the, in the United States, more people struggling with loneliness than adults who smoke uh, in the United States. So this is both common mm. and it's also consequential for our health. And it's invisible. And it's invisible. Yeah. yeah. It's invisible. It's incredibly striking. And you talk about it, how in your book together, the healing power of human connection in a sometimes lonely world, which I encourage everyone to get a copy of, whether you're lonely or not, because mm -hmm. likely you know someone is and That's likely right. um, the things in this book are going to help you get more connected to things that matter in your life and also help you 
engage with your community in different ways to build love and connection, which is what this is all about. Hi, everyone. Hope you're enjoying the episode. Before we continue, we have a quick message from Dr. Mark Hyman about his new company, Pharmacy, and their first product, the 10-Day Reset. Hey, it's Dr. Hyman. Do you have FLC? What's FLC? It's when you feel like crap. It's a problem that so many people suffer from and often have no idea that it's not normal or that you can fix it. I mean, you know the feeling. It's when you're super sluggish, your digestion's off, you can't think clearly, or you have brain fog, or you just feel run down. Can you relate? I know most people can. But the real question is, what the heck do we do about it? Well, I hate to break the news, but there's no magic bullet. FLC isn't caused by one single thing, so there's not one single solution. However, there is a systems-based approach, a way to tackle the multiple root factors that contribute to FLC, and I call that system the 10-day reset. The 10-Day Reset combines food, key lifestyle habits, and targeted supplements to address FLC straight on. It's a protocol that I've used with thousands of my community members to help them get their health back on track. It's not a magic bullet. It's not a quick fix. It's a system that works. If you want to learn more and get your health back on track, click on the button below or visit getpharmacy.com. That's getpharmacy with an F, F F-A-R-M-A-C-Y.com. Now back to this week's episode. You talk about in the book how loneliness also has not just impact on the individual but you know in a broader context it affects our kids ability to function and learn in school it affects productivity in the workplace and effectiveness on a on a sort of commercial level of competitiveness it affects this incredible polarization and division in our society i mean i you know i I remember hearing um this guy peter orzag who was a budget director under Mm -hmm. obama talk at Cleveland Clinic about um, the voting in Congress. And in the 60s, you know, you could see a sort of a cloud of votes for Republicans, Democrats. It was all mixed. It was a big Mm -hmm. Venn diagram where there was tons of overlap and voting across party lines. And and then he showed a graph now, and it was just a complete separation. And we're seeing that mirrored like I've never seen before in history in Mm -hmm. terms of lack of ability for our government to function, but then it's spreading out in terms of divisiveness and conflict among all kinds of groups, racial groups, um, and and, and, um, all these different divisions in society that are really, I think, crippling our ability to actually have a great society. Mm -hmm. And um, so so can you talk more about how loneliness is driving some of these trends and what we can do about it? Yeah. This is one of the reasons that I wanted to focus on this issue, because when I came out of uh, government. When I finished my, my time as Surgeon General, I I found myself thinking about all the different issues we had touched on, from the opiate epidemic to violence to e-cigarettes, you name it, Ebola, Zika. <clears throat> Bet you're glad you're not having to deal with coronavirus right now. <laughs> That's a frightening <laughs> this thing. This is a difficult, yeah, a very difficult and disturbing situation yeah. right now. And I think it's sadly only going to get worse before it gets better. Mm-hmm. But one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to ask myself the question, what's at the root cause of many of these deeper issues? Mm-hmm. Um, and can I do something to make a small contribution to addressing that deeper root cause? And what I kept coming back to again and again, guided both by the conversations I had with people around the country and the science that I was reading, was that our connection with each other is actually one of the most powerful and important resources that we have, not just for our health, but that affects our performance in the world, in mm. school, in the workplace, that impacts whether we talk to each other or not uh, in communities, and even has an impact on our politics. And that's why I wanted to work on this. And here's why, how it affects us. You know, if we can't, when we are connected to each other, our threat levels are lower, mm. our levels of stress are lower. Mm. When we are lonely, it increases our threat level and actually shifts our focus internally towards ourselves. Mm. Because if you're in a threat state, you wanna focus on yourself for your own your safety and survival. Um, but it's hard to optimize our output. It's hard to be the best person we can be and bring our full self to the task, if you will, if we're in a constant state of stress and if we're so focused in ourse- on ourselves that we're missing what's happening in the outside world. Mm. Um, you can see that playing out you know, in the workplaces and schools and, 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 and in Congress as well, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and you can see like, uh, what a price we pay mm-hmm. as a society because the, the political dysfunction impacts us all. But also when people aren't happy in the workplace, that impacts productivity and retention. Uh, It impacts creativity in the workplace. That impacts a a, a business's or an organization's bottom line. 
But in schools, what concerns me most, especially as a, a dad who has two young kids who are mm. three and two, mm. um, is I think about what experience they're going to have in school. And I ask myself, well, is the job of school to teach people how to read, write, you know, and do arithmetic? Or is it also to teach kids how to build a foundation for a healthy life in other ways, including in terms of their social and emotional well-being? You know, I always and, say the three things you never learn in school that are the most important things in life, how to have healthy relationships, how to take care of your health, and how to manage your money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right. So these things, these are the foundations that matter. And when we, we don't have and one of these key important foundations, what we realize is that everything else we build on it is built on a shaky foundation. Mm -hmm. And I realize that when we have strong relationships in our lives, we are better. We are better at work, we're better at play, we're better in terms of our health, we're better in terms in our relationships and what we bring to our family and to our friends. When we don't, when we feel lonely, all of those things are more fragile and they're more likely to, to collapse on us. And so that's why when I thought about this issue, I felt like if we can try, if we can make a shift as a society from being one that is focused on wealth, reputation, and power to one that is focused on people, if we can truly create a people-centered life and a people-centered society, then I think we can capture the great power of social connection mm -hmm. and experience the joys and the benefits that it has to bring to our health and ultimately to all of our lives. And there's good data on this. It's not just like a warm and fuzzy, touchy-feely thing mm -hmm. to sort of help end loneliness and get people to connect it to each other. There's actually great data on how much a difference it makes in overall society and the, the success of our country, the success of, of our, our citizens, the health, mm -hmm. of, the health of them. All, all, the, all the things that really we care about are, are centered around this issue. And That's right. you know, your book isn't called Alone, it's called Together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the reason is because in it, you tell some amazing stories about people who solved this in their communities and are trying to break through this incredible f sort of edifice of loneliness that surrounds so many, so many people. So can you tell us a little yeah. bit about some of the hopeful stories and some of the things that... Absolutely. You know, because it's kind of depressing is we're all lonely and everybody's <laughs> lonely and it's ruining everything, which is true. How do we get out of it? And what are the sort of stories that you, you can share about how that's happening? Yeah, so to me, this is actually a deeply inspiring topic for exactly that reason, because there are so many stories that we don't read about or hear about in the papers every day, but of people who in their own lives uh, are building connection and building community and helping to create, I think, what all of us want. But the other thing that's fascinating about it to me is that in building a connected life does not require us to purchase expensive medicines. It does not require us to have special medical equipment. It doesn't require fancy and expensive programs. It only requires what we already have inside of us, mm. which is our desire and our ability to give and receive love with each other. I remember being at the at, at the White House for an event during, that when we were working on the opioid epidemic, and I was facilitating a conversation uh, with a group of people uh, about the epidemic and what was driving it. <clears throat> and it was in that moment, I remember sitting on that stage, where it struck me that we were talking about medication-assisted therapy and counseling and all of the other things that we need to put in place to help people struggling with opioid use disorder. And it struck me in that moment that with so many people uh, that I met on the road felt like they were lacking were relationships. And at the heart of those relationships and communities were love. Mm. And I really do believe that love is the oldest medicine that we have. There you go. Love and is medicine. <laughs> it, it is. It is. And of all the medicines I prescribe and you prescribe and so many doctors prescribe in the hospitals to treat our patients, those are important. Those are good. But there are few things that come close to the power of what genuine human uh, relationships can do. And those are powered by love. Some of the stories I, uh, that I came across were really fascinating in this regard. I came across um, a mayor, uh, Tom Tate, uh, from Anaheim, California, uh, who is the last person you would think of as leading a social movement in his community because he's a self-described introvert, really didn't like to hang, hang out with other people very much, <laughs> and also was deathly afraid of public speaking. And he but was a mayor. <laughs> right, so what ended up happening is just by... Uh, you know, uh, accident of, uh, you, know, you know, of life, he was appointed to serve an, 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 on the city council because there was a vacancy and the mayor knew him and appointed him. So he took that on, found he enjoyed it, 
actually joined a Toastmasters club to get more comfortable with public speaking, mm. really had to work through a lot of issues and then ran for city council again. And then the mayor, the, the mayor seat opened up and he thought, you know, maybe, maybe I should run for mayor because what was really interesting is he had been, he'd been seeing these signs around town, these posters, uh, which had talked about, which were posters about kindness it said, mm. be kind, and talk, we talked about the importance of kindness. But there was no name stamp below it. There was no sponsoring organization. There was no URL to go to right. to learn more. It was literally just a poster with the message of kindness. And he kept thinking to himself, this feels right. This feels like what our community needs. We need more kindness. That's the glue that holds us together. And without that, all these programs that we're funding and structuring, et cetera, well-intended as they are, are not going to work as well if people mm -hmm. aren't connected to each other and invested in each other. Mm -hmm. So he decided to run for mayor on a platform of making Anaheim a city of kindness. Wow. And now he was scared about this. He thought, oh, I'm gonna get laughed out of town. People are gonna think I'm not a serious candidate. I'm gonna be made fun of or my, my, being my, soft. Um, yeah. My political platform is kindness. How about that? <laughs> exactly, I mean, but you know what he found? When he got up to announce his candidacy and to say that his goal was to make Anaheim a kinder city, he saw heads nodding in the audience. Mm. He saw people murmuring mm. approval. Mm. And he realized that so many of us, even though we may not lead with it, mm. we want more kindness, we want more love, we want more connection in our lives and in our communities. So he eventually won uh, that race. He became Incredible. the mayor of Anaheim. He created all of these programs uh, from neighborhood programs to get neighbors to connect more deeply with each other to a one, million acts you know, a 1 million acts of kindness program in the school system to get the school's uh, students throughout Anaheim to, con to basically engage in random acts of kindness and then to come together and share those experiences. And talking to him was such a beautiful experience because I came to see that through this focus on kindness, that what he did, which was incredibly powerful, is he didn't just set up a new program, he changed culture in the city. And when you change culture, which are the values and the ideas that people mm. hold to be important, wow. then you have a huge ripple effect on not just the programs they support, but on how they live their lives. Yeah. And that's what he saw throughout Anaheim. That's incredible. Uh, and, and you know, it's something you can't legislate, right? You, you have to mm -hmm. sort of create the structures to do that. And I, you know, I think I, I um, sort of had a very similar insight to you is that the, the, the cause of so much of our disease and dis-ease is disconnection. Mm. And, um, and through you know, my work in Haiti with Paul Farmer, uh, looking at what he did to treat infectious disease using community health workers, mm -hmm. essentially neighbors and peers and friends to help each other through making sure they took their medications and they knew what to do and mm -hmm. were, were helping each other be accountable. Um, he pr produced a program that was more effective than anything else the public health community in the world had ever seen yeah. and was spread across the world. And I, and I kind of realized that it, it's not just infectious disease that's contagious, it's chronic illness, which affects six out of 10 of us. And as you know, is, is sort of driving our economy into the mm -hmm. ground and is burdening so many people and creates so much suffering. And a lot of the reason for it, like you said, is, is the disconnection that drives people to behaviors and into things that actually aren't good for them, mm -hmm. like food or whatever. And and then I worked with Rick Warren to create the Daniel Plan which with, with Dr. Amen, which was a, a faith-based wellness program, but it was founded on the idea of small groups mm -hmm. that it, were the infrastructure of the church that we just put the information in. And they were able to help each other get better, that you know, mm -hmm. getting healthy is basically a team sport. And um, we've taken that now to Cleveland Clinic in a secular way. Uh, it's not a faith-based wellness program. We, we, we now um, are the top in our small center for functional medicine, which has 10 doctors, is the number one in group visits in the entire organization. Huh. And the next biggest or group down from us has about 400 doctors. Huh. And we have like 10. <laughs> and, we, and the reason is I, I, I was very vocal about making sure that we, we actually did this because this is how people change. Mm -hmm. And we see that people have a longing to belong and a longing to connect and 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 that's how they make meaning out of their lives that's how they get motivated to mm -hmm. do anything and that's what we're really missing from our culture and society and how do you um you know you know how how do you how do you see that that um we can spread this further mm -hmm. um how do you how do you take the ideas in your book and make them sort of something we spread nationally and even globally 
Hmm. Well, I think there are a couple of things we can do. I think first by recognizing how common loneliness is, but also by recognizing the power of human connection to elevate our health, our performance, and our well-being. I think that first step uh, can help us to rethink our priorities, both our individual priorities, where we're putting our time, but also organizationally, like where, as workplaces and schools and governments, we're allocating resources. The second thing is I think we can think about what steps we can take in our individual life uh, to actually create more connection. The truth is whether you're feeling lonely right now uh, or whether you're not, you undoubtedly know people who are lonely and all of us are at risk of loneliness mm -hmm. at various points in our lives. Loneliness isn't something that you know, you're born with and affects you for your entire life. We go through natural periods of connection and disconnection in our mm -hmm. life. Um, and the question is how do we prepare for that? How do we deal with it? How do we build a strong foundation of connection to, to begin with? So there are a couple of things in the, in the book that I, I go through that are, I believe, helpful in building that connected life. One of them unexpectedly uh, is service. Ah. It, it turns out yeah. that when we serve uh, others, we actually break some of these very negative patterns of loneliness that get in, in basically launched within us as a part of our evolutionary uh, history. Uh, those patterns being the focus on self and also the elevated threat level uh, that we mm -hmm. experience when we're lonely. Mm -hmm. Because when you help somebody else, first of all, that takes you away from a focus on yourself and you're focusing on, on another person. But the second thing is it's also disarming. Like when you're helping other people, you're also reminded of what value you have to offer to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's actually reassuring. That lowers your, your sense of threat. Mm -hmm. uh, so service is a powerful way to connect with others and also to reconnect in a sense, with ourself, our own sense of self-worth and value. The second thing, though, that can help us on an individual level is to think about where we're spending our time when it comes to social relationships. So number one, are we making sure that we have at least five to 10 minutes a day that we're spending with people we love? That mm -hmm. could be spending in person. It could be speaking to them on the phone you know, or through video conferencing. Mm -hmm. But are we spending five to 10 minutes with someone that we love every day. Mm -hmm. And this might seem very simple, yeah. but you'd be surprised how many people can go for days uh, without having a meaningful conversation uh, with somebody. Mm. The third thing with- uh, Matt, Can I interrupt for a second? Yeah, yeah, of so course. So just remind me, like, when my wife, we have a, because life's busy, crazy, and running around, we have a, a little ritual we do called What's Up Below, huh. which is you know not just chit-chatting about the logistics of our life or what we're doing that day, but you know to sit down with each other, whether it's having coffee in the morning or at the end of the day, and it can be five minutes or it can be, I mean, we can sometimes go for mm -hmm. half an hour, an hour, but it's what's up below, like not so just beautiful. on the surface. And we go in and we just listen to each other and we get each other and like what's happening in your yeah. inner world. What do you care about? What's upsetting you? What's thrilling you? What's whatever going on? And it just creates such a deep, powerful moment of like being seen and seeing somebody else. It's mm -hmm. like, every, it just, it just, it's so powerful and we don't do that. And you can do that with a friend. You can do that with, yes. you know, I do that with my children. I do it. It's, it's a very powerful simple thing of just say dropping into a place below the just surface level of life that we all do in all the time. Yeah. That's such a beautiful example. And what I love about that is Mark, I imagine with you and your wife, you could easily uh, get caught up in the logistics of life and spend that 10 minutes <laughs> totally. just talking about your calendars and your yeah. schedules and who's yes. going to get groceries yes. and who's going to get the uh -huh. car fixed. And, you know, and I fall into that with my wife as yeah. well, because there are a lot of logistics in life yeah. that we got to work through. But, but even just that five minutes can make an extraordinary impact. And that comes down to also another point about the quality of time that we mm -hmm. spend. So, you know, technology is really interesting and we can have a conversation about technology and how it's impacted our connection mm -hmm. with one another. But one of the things that I think that many of us do now, um, and I certainly have been guilty of this, is we have s allowed technology, particularly our phones, to dilute the quality of our interactions yeah. with other people because we bring our phones off into the dinner table or, and we can, might convince ourselves, hey, I'm not really paying attention to it. I've got it on silent, I've put it face down. Uh, I'm not really paying attention to it. But we actually know from studies that when there is a phone even within sight, yeah. even if it's on vibrate and face down, yeah. it actually changes how people feel about the conversation That's in a negative true. way. That's and true. so <laughs> thinking, but there's a restaurant called hearth which is in new york city and they have a uh -huh. little box on every table that says please open me and you open it up and it's like it has an invitation to put your phones in the oh, box beautiful. for dinner and uh huh. there's a game i sometimes play with my friends everybody has to put their phone in the box the first person to take it out pays the bill <laughs> <laughs> so you know there's several fun things you can do that actually help you stay more connected i love that 
Absolutely. That's yeah. a great idea. <laughs> so just like that, I think there are, you know, in the book, what I will try to do is I try to share some stories that lay out some individual steps we can mm-hmm. take in our lives, but mm-hmm. also uh, stories that talk about what schools and workplaces uh, can do and are doing already mm-hmm. in some cases to create a culture of connection. Because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, Mark, like if we want to create real connection, if we want to build a people-centered life and mm-hmm. a people-centered society, it's going to involve more than programs. It's going to require us to shift culture mm-hmm. and to ask ourselves what's really important. Now, if, if we got a hundred, group of 100 people together on any street corner in America, my guess is if you ask them to name their top three priorities, the people would be at the top of that list. People might say, it's my daughter or my son or my spouse mm-hmm. or my mom or my dad. But if you look at how they behave, so, yeah, how where we put our time and energy, and where frankly society nudges us to spend mm-hmm. our time and energy, mm-hmm. it's not usually with the people we love most. It's in investing it in places where we can acquire greater power, reputation, and wealth. The mm-hmm. traditional marks of achievement in mm-hmm. modern society. I'm not saying that those aren't important or those are shouldn't be pursued. It's a question of where are they on the priority list. And or I worry it's your Facebook feed or Instagram feed or your email or. Right. And with those feeds in particular, like I think about like our childhood and about the childhood that my kids will be experiencing. And in modern childhood, I think the messages, the cultural messages about what matters are just coming at you a thousand times faster. And I meet so many young people who are feeling because of this culture of comparison on social media, that they are not thin enough, that they're not good looking enough, that they're not popular enough or funny enough, or that they're not enough, enough. Whatever, right. you know, that ultimately that they're not enough. Mm-hmm. And that has actually a very powerful and insidious effect on our connection with other people. Mm. And this is one of the things I think that is not often uh, well appreciated, which is that our connection to other people is ultimately built on having a strong connection to ourself. Mm. Now, what does it mean to have a strong connection to ourself? It means to know that we have a sense of worth and value. It means to recognize that we are human beings who have something meaningful to add uh, to the world. And that requires a combination of self-knowledge and self-compassion. Now, how do we develop self-knowledge? Well, we develop it partly by living life, but not only by living life, by having time to reflect and time to think. And much of that white space in our life that many people used to ponder and reflect on things on, that has disappeared. It's evaporated as now in the five minutes you have between events or when you're waiting at the bus stop, we, mm-hmm. we just pull out our devices and look at the news or check mm-hmm. our inbox. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, if our if we are not able to support, particularly among our kids, a healthy sense of self, if we're not able to convey to them and help them understand what it is that makes them worthy and valuable, and that it's not what they're wearing or how much money their parents have in their pockets or how popular they are and what parties they're getting you know invited to, then we are gonna run into a situation where people feel less and less adequate, and then they will seek to be the people that they think other people want them to be. And when we do that, that's a recipe for loneliness. When we try to be something we're not, uh, when we can't inhabit our own skin, people feel lonely. That's why workplaces often struggle with loneliness, because for years we have told people that, you know, don't bring feelings to the workplace and check all of that at the door, and you know, you're not here to make friends, you're here to, mm-hmm. to get work done mm-hmm. and keep your friendships and your personal life outside. And the truth is that's just not a natural way of living. No. You know, we don't operate like that as human beings. Mm-hmm. And if we have to be somebody that we're not in the workplace, that increases our likelihood of being lonely there too. That's true. I mean, we, we, we certainly get trained as doctors to not emotionally connect with our patients, right? And I, I fought that from day one and when you sit and really get someone and you listen to them and what matters and what they care about and you really are present with them, it's, it's just so powerfully healing. Forget mm-hmm. any other medicine, right? And I think that's, that's a, it's one of the real gifts. And I, I think I just want to come back to the whole service concept because I don't know if people understand what that means. When we look at you know how we're designed, um, there is a sort of altruism gene that mm-hmm. we have. Uh, you know, E.O. Wilson talks about the social conquest of the earth, this book that we cannot survive in isolation and that we're hardwired to support each other, help each other, connect with each other and aid each other. And the biology of it's very fascinating. When you look at the areas of the brain that get stimulated by altruism or service or helping others, um, it actually is the same area of the brain that gets activated with heroin or cocaine Mm -hmm. or sugar. And I, you know, I remember going to Haiti and, um, you know, 
it was just it was just an awful horrible scene with 300,000 people dead 300,000 wounded I mean the military who was there the 82nd Airborne said they'd never seen anything like this in their entire mm. careers and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and we were in the middle of it but uh, and I was working 20 hours a day and it was it was horrible conditions and no food no water I mean it was really tough and and yet I was really happy in this weird mm. way because I was just serving I was helping I was serving it wasn't for me it wasn't for my ego it wasn't for mm. anything my bank account I was volunteering and it was it was a time that I felt most connected and most fulfilled to what really mattered and and I really think you know, we need to have a society where we are helping each other and are connecting with each other. And and it doesn't require anything other than to look around you and see who's in need or, you know, what needs to get done in your community and trying to be that person who can be of service because it'll not only help you with your own emotional, physical, mm-hmm. mental health, but it's going to create a culture, like you said, of kindness and love. And that's, that's such funny. what we need in America today, <laughs> around the world, globally, because we're in a sort of, veering the opposite way and I think that's why your book is so critical and I encourage everybody to get a copy of Together the healing power of human connection in a sometimes only world because uh, if all of us took up this book and implemented it in our own lives and implemented it in our workplace in our schools in our families in our communities I think this country would turn around pretty fast <laughs> <laughs> I certainly hope so that's that's my it's my dream that we will yeah. together be able to build a more connected and more fulfilled society, hmm. and and um, what are the what are the challenges some people have to actually doing this in their life? Because it sounds hmm. like everybody would want to do this, but how do, how do how do people get over those obstacles? It's a great question. I think there are a few key obstacles that come up. Number one, sometimes people feel that focusing on connections in their own life is somehow self indulgent. Uh, that they should be focusing on doing more at work, on getting that promotion, on building up their bank account on taking their kids uh, to activities. You know, busy parents, I think, are very interesting because I think a lot of them struggle with loneliness, Mm. uh, especially in the early years, uh, you know, when their kids are one, two, three, four years old before they're in school. um, You know, it can be very all-consuming as a parent to to really take care of your children, and that can isolate you from others. Mm. But I think this feeling that somehow investing in our connections is a luxury, that it's self-indulgent, I think is one of the reasons why people don't do it more. Um, I think the second reason is that, again, there's a sense of shame that people have and even admitting to others that they need uh, some more human contact, that they Mm. need some time Mm. uh, with their friends. They don't Mm. want to seem desperate or needy or somehow, Mm. you know, again, not likable or uh, or an outcast in some way. So people have a hard time not just acknowledging to other people, but even acknowledging it uh, to themselves. And I think the last thing is there's a structural issue as well, which is that if you look at how our lives are designed, mm. uh, with paying, spending so many hours at work, and uh, many people have to commute many of those hours, there's a, there's a question of of time that comes up, which is where where am I going to find the time to go and interact uh, with other people and it, and to take a vacation with my best friends, which I haven't done in a long time, or to finally make time to go away with my spouse you know, for a weekend. Mm-hmm. And those questions feel really burdensome. I mean, you, they can feel really tiring when you think about it, like, oh my God, that's so hard. Let me just keep going with life. But this is where I think it's so powerful and important to recognize that the dividends that come from just a small mm-hmm. amount of time spent mm-hmm. in connection can last for hours, days, weeks, or even yeah. longer. And that's why the, the five or 10 minutes that you spend with someone that you love can be really powerful. I'll tell you about something I did in my own life that helped me, um, which is that you know, I, I made a decision after residency training uh, when I had just gone through several years of caring for incredibly sick people, uh, including people who were very young. I remember being on the oncology service and half the patients I was taking care of were all young people in their 20s who had gastric cancer or other malignancies that were in their end stage. And I remember at the end of that thinking, God, I just, I need to think about my life. And I don't know, like that could be me. Yeah. And am I spending my time the way I want to be spending it? So I made a decision that I would make it a point to go home and visit my parents and my sister more often. And that's when the frequency of my visits actually changed. Um, a year or two ago, I was actually out in Colorado uh, for a fellowship retreat at a point where I was struggling to figure out what I wanted to do with my life and was 
um, was also feeling kind of isolated. You know, I was in the throes of early parenthood also, and it was all consumed with the care of our kids, which was mm-hmm. wonderful and such a blessing, but really not having much in terms of relationships outside. Uh, and I ran into these two friends there who I love, and but who I rarely ever see. And we talked about how we wish we got together more often, but we just don't. And then in that moment, I said, why don't we do this? I said, why don't we build a moai together? And yeah. a moai is a Japanese term. I actually have a whole story about a moai in the book. But it's an intentional community. So I said, why don't we just say, because we know we're not going to see each other, you know, probably for another six, nine months. Why don't we say that every month that we are going to get on video conference together and that we're going to have a two hour conversation. And let's also say that we're going to be real with each other, that mm. we're going to talk about the issues that we are struggling with, mm. the stuff that really matters to us, yeah. things like health and finances mm. and our relationships with family, which people don't get into often because yeah. they're sticky, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. it's the stuff that we all are struggling yeah. with. And so we've been doing that for mm. the last year. Yeah. And it's been so incredibly gratifying. So, healing. so anyway, the point is that there are b- b- reasons to not connect, but once we realize the power of even a small amount of time spent connecting with others, once we realize that we don't need anything else to do that, we just need our intention and a willingness to show up, to listen, to be vulnerable and open uh, with other people in our life, then we can start building that road toward living a truly connected life. And I think that is what holds the key to greater health and also greater fulfillment. That's so true. Thank you for doing this, writing this book. I think it's it's, it's those micro steps, whether it's five minutes a day, mm-hmm. whether it's finding some old friends and reconnecting like you did, whether it's finding a place to be of service in your community. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have to have some big, you know, giant community that you're building overnight, but those micro steps make a huge difference and will help heal so much of the suffering in the world. So thank you, Vivek, for writing this book. Uh, I want everybody to get a copy. Uh, It's Together, uh, The Healing Power of Human Connection is Sometimes Only World. Uh, You can learn more about it. Go to his website, which is uh, vivekmurthy.com, V-I-V-E-K-M-U-R-T-H-Y.com forward slash together dash book. Uh, please get it anywhere you get your books. Um, if you love this conversation, uh, please share it with your friends and family on social media. Leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll see you next week on The Doctor's Pharmacy. Thanks so much, Mark. So much fun to do this together.